and you're ready to go. Have a good session. Okay, hello everybody, and welcome to the Crypto in the Cloud session of Real World Cryptography. We have three excellent talks that I'm happy to uh, introduce the speakers for uh, today. First, we have Kenny Patterson speaking about system-wide security for searchable symmetric encryption, which um, shortens to Swiss, I believe it's, it's how it's pronounced. So Kenny, I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Nick. Hopefully you can see my slides and everybody can hear me. All good? Yes, okay, so this is a joint work with uh, Zichen Gui from University of Bristol, Shikhar Panjshanabis, who was with ETH Zurich and now is at Visa Research, and Bogdan Verinchke from the University of Bristol and Definity uh, based at Zurich. And uh, the, all of this work was done while we were um, all in Zurich uh, last year. And so that's why we came up with the uh, outstanding backronym of SWISA, System-Wide Security for Searchable Symmetric Encryption. Our work is on ePrint and you can find the link there at the bottom of the page. So let me begin by introducing searchable encryption. Here we have a client who wants to outsource the storage of some large collection of documents. Here we only have three, D0, D1, D2, to a server um, providing cloud services. And uh, these documents have some keywords and the client wants to retain the capability to uh, search over the documents for the keywords. Of course, in practice, we have much larger systems than this. We might have hundreds of thousands or even millions of documents and hundreds of thousands or millions of keywords. We want to outsource our storage. And of course, we may be in a situation where we don't want to trust the server to have access to all of our plain text data. And so we'd like to use encryption uh, to, to uh, provide this capability, but still providing the ability to perform searches over the data for keywords. In the simplest kind of form, uh, we would have single keyword searches where the client can send some kind of encrypted version of a keyword Alice, in this case, to the server. The server would perform some computation over the encrypted data and send back the relevant list of documents here, D0, D1, because uh, both documents, D0 and D1, contain the keyword Alice and no other documents do. More generally, um, you might imagine being able to do um, conjunctive or more complex keyword searches and ultimately uh, be able to do some kind of form of SQL queries over your encrypted data. Okay, uh, what does symmetric or searchable symmetric encryption mean, SSE? It just means that in this, uh, in building this encrypted system, we're only allowed to use symmetric techniques, uh, ostensibly for efficiency reasons. Okay, so that introduces the concept of SSE. Um, let me start now um, getting into the idea of system-wide security for SSE by introducing a very simple uh, searchable symmetric encryption scheme um, that is sort of a toy example that we can use to understand why we need to consider system-wide security. So we have our same set of documents as before. And in this uh, toy system, we're going to use just a pseudo-random function FK and an NCPA secure symmetric encryption scheme, uh, which I'll denote by NCK. Of course, here one should use different keys for the different functions and the different schemes. But for simplicity of notation, we just have a single key. The scheme here is built by using uh, two data structures at the server. A search index, which is just a key value store in which we uh, represent the uh, keywords by pseudo random functions of those keywords. So that gives us our first column here. So we have FK of Alice, FK of Bob, and FK of Crypto. And then the values corresponding to those keywords are just encrypted versions of the document identifiers which contain those keywords. So this is like an inverted search index uh, in, in the encrypted domain. And an important point here for later is to see that these uh, encrypted um, uh, lists of documents are padded with uh, hash values, meaning uh, just uh, you know random nonsense, uh, to make sure that all of the entries in this table have the same length. And this is to limit the, the possibility for things like um, frequency analysis attacks. And uh, similarly, uh, the second component of the system is a document array in which we just have the NCP encrypted documents. And now when a client wants to make a query to such a system, uh, suppose the client wants to find all of the documents containing uh, the, the keyword Alice, then the client will create the search token, FK of Alice, and send that to the server. The server will do a lookup in its key value store and send back the encrypted list of all of the relevant documents. And then in a second phase, the client goes back to the, now to the second data structure, the document array, and says, please give me back the first and second documents. These come back now again in encrypted form. And finally, the client can do perform client-side decryption under the key K to obtain the two documents, D0 and D1. And now the, the, the search is completed. 
And now what we have to think about is the security of this kind of system. And um, in most of the current literature, the current security notions that we have only address the components of the system that are inside the red box here. Um, in particular, they would uh, try to protect um, leakage of uh, sensitive data from the, the lookups to the search index in the top part here, and also prevent analysis of the, uh, the static document array just through normal NCPA encryption. But importantly, those um, existing security notions that are very common in the literature do not address the second part of the system where we actually go and fetch the documents. And um, what we re would really like to uh, have is a stronger security notion that caters for the entire system, so a system-wide security notion. So we'd like to have security notions that consider the leakage from the entire system uh, here uh, surrounding both phases, uh, both online phases of the, of the system. And actually this example really clearly illustrates why we want to do this. So uh, this system is designed so that we have the padding on the encrypted responses, the encrypted lists of document identifiers. And so it looks like from the perspective of the red box that all of the frequency analysis attacks that are quite obvious here are prevented because we have the padding. So all of the responses have the same length. But when you look at the system from the system wide perspective inside the green box, we see that we actually make a number of queries to the document array. We ask for the first and second documents that reveals the frequency of the keyword. So when we look from a system wide perspective, there are actually very simple attacks against this toy um, SSE system. But what I want to tell you is that, in fact, many, many schemes in the literature, including state of the art schemes, are vulnerable to attack when you look at them from a system wide perspective. And so we're in a situation currently where there is a very uh, significant mismatch between the models and the schemes for SSE that are being developed in the scientific community and the real world threats that such schemes should be addressing. And this is the first key takeaway I would like to uh, give you for the talk. So at this point, I would like to introduce uh, Swiss, uh, and this is our attempt to uh, try to close this gap between the current state of the art and what we should really be doing uh, in this system-wide view of security for searchable symmetric encryption. Um, and so uh, what we provide is a pair of schemes, a static scheme and a dynamic scheme. The difference here is the dynamic scheme allows you to do insertion and deletion queries as well as searches over the encrypted data. And uh, Swiss schemes are designed to minimize the system-wide leakage and also achieve good performance. We do this at the same time as providing broader, stronger security definitions that model the system-wide security leakage, the system-wide leakage. And these are in the style of ideal world, real world security definitions, which identify leakage functions in a similar style to what's already been done in the SSE literature. We also provide security proofs for the Swiss schemes. And finally, we do benchmarking for a realistic data set. So we use the Enron email corpus, which has around 400,000 or 500,000 documents. Some of the core techniques that we use in Swissa involve, uh, again, using key value stores, again, using two key value stores, which means the client server uh, interactions involve two round trips. We use bucketization, which is a padding technique to even out the frequencies of keywords and documents. We also use here, importantly, inspired by ORAM techniques, a client-side stash, and pseudo-random write-backs. So what this means is that each search operation performed by a client results in deleting the index and the document data on the server once they have been returned to the client, stashing freshly randomized encryptions of the, the tokens and the, the relevant data and the, docu the data documents themselves at the client, and then performing pseudo-random write-backs of some of the data at each uh, um, operation from the stash to the server. And what this does is it, is it mixes data over time from different reads from the database, from the encrypted database or the encrypted document store. We also achieve oblivi oblivious operations for the dynamic case, which means that you cannot um, tell apart the search operations and the addition and deletion operations. Um, and this actually very quickly enables us to prove things like forward and backward security, which are standard security properties for symmetric searchable encryption schemes. Um, there is a leakage profile still from the Swiss scheme in common with all uh, practical SSE schemes. And uh, so we reduce, but we don't eliminate completely the leakage. And to do this, one would need worst case padding and full ORAM, which leads to really significant overheads uh, to completely remove all of the leakage. The Swiss scheme, unfortunately, does have a complex and stateful leakage profile. 
So one might wonder, well, what are the security implications of this? How can one judge what security you actually achieve from a scheme like ours? And the only way to find this out currently is to do cryptanalysis. So we did that. We did the best cryptanalysis we could. We tried to break our scheme. We tried very hard. And in doing that, we actually improved the state of the art of attacks on SSE. And we plan to uh, produce a separate paper that describes those attacks in detail and shows how to break a number of schemes in the literature uh, which, have, uh, um, which are vulnerable to our new attacks. We were able to design our scheme so that it resists these attacks, but I would say that this is only friendly cryptanalysis. And of course, we would then encourage the community to take a look at what we're doing and see if it can be broken. Finally, uh, the Swiss implementation um, uses standard cryptographic off-the-shelf components implemented in, on the client side in Java and JCE. On the server side, we just use a Redis server straight out of the box, just a Redis key value store, nothing else is needed. Um, we did experiments in a local host slash LAN environment. And just to give you a flavor of the kind of benchmarks that we have, this graph is showing the uh, query response time in milliseconds on the, on the y-axis against the query response size um, for different uh, sizes of document stores. And so the, the yellow or green line here uh, on the bottom is just raw plain text that you would get from looking up a standard key value store doing document searches. And so the gap between the green line and the other line shows the overhead of our approach. We have a logarithmic scale here and uh, the gap is something like a 6x overhead in query response time compared to doing things in plain text. That corresponds to uh, in a full ORAM solution, the overhead might be something around a million or 10 million compared to a factor of six or seven here. So we are making a huge improvement over ORAM at the cost of having imperfect security, which has to be evaluated by cryptanalyzing the leakage profile. So to summarize, uh, there's a mismatch between the scientific literature and the real world threats that are uh, actually pertinent to uh, symmetric searchable encryption. Um, we introduce SWISA, um, a pair of schemes which aim to close that gap. And you can find all the details in uh, our ePrint on ICR, and also our code is available on GitHub if you want to take a look at it. And we welcome cryptanalysis of our scheme. Uh, so, and at the end of the session, uh, please come say hi in the RWC social app. We'll set up a room there, uh, a breakout room where we can uh, very happily talk to you um, as much as you like um, about the details of SWISA. That's everything from me. Thank you very much for your attention. Great, thanks, Kenny. Um, there are no questions here. So I have one quick question is, can you help provide a little bit of um, intuition about what an attack on this type of system would look like? Um, what sort of access would an attacker need to have? What would the sequence of events look, look like in a, in a practical um, description? Okay, in, in a general setting, uh, we, I didn't say this explicitly, but we consider the server to be adversarial. So the server is interested in learning as much as it can from observing the queries that are made uh, by looking at what um, you know, areas of memory or areas of hard disk it looks at, which documents are returned and so on. Um, and so we're really here thinking about, for the most part, um, an attacker who is really the server providing the service. You can also consider a network attacker who might uh, observe, say, the encrypted communications between the client and the server. So you can assume everything is running over TLS, for example. And such an attacker might be uh, limited to seeing um, the, uh, um, uh, being able to do uh, analysis of volumes of data being exchanged or directionality of traffic. So identifying, you know, when are queries being made, when are responses being returned and so on. Does that, is that the kind of answer you were looking for? Yeah, absolutely. There's um, a few questions that have just popped up after that, that answer. So Dennis Jackson asks, uh, if data is deleted from the server mixed by the clients and written back, does the client have to be trusted to write, the ba write back the correct data, i.e. must every client write permissions to anything they can read? Yes, and it's the client's data, so that makes perfect sense. The client has a strong incentivization to write back the data uh, in a reasonable amount of time from the stash. Okay, a uh, question from Surya Rian. What client storage is necessary for this scheme? Can multiple clients with the same key access the same database? Uh, I.e., do they share stash? Okay, um, so this, the, let me take the second part first. No, this is a single user uh, scheme. Uh, it's a great question to think about extending these techniques to multi-writer systems. Uh, we haven't done that yet. Um, interesting topic to explore. Uh, on the first question, there is uh, a stash size. Um, we have figures in the paper. I don't have them off the top of my head, but as far as I recall, the stash stays small 
except when you when you make queries that involve many many documents being returned because then you have to stash them and then write them back over time um, and so in the paper we give uh, kind of worst case estimates for the stash size and also uh, the results of running practical experiments for standard queries so please see the paper for for full details on that Okay, we have a few more questions. I'm going to cut off the line because we are already quite behind. But um, one from Joaquin Shipper, he says, what happens if a client crashes while processing, writing back a query? Does the system stay available secure? Right, so there's no impact on security if the client crashes. But of course, if the client crashes without having uh, maybe written the stash to disk, then it's going to lose that data. So there is a there's definitely an issue there uh, in deleting data on the server and not having it available on the client because of client-side failure. One way to handle that is to um, uh, not immediately delete data from the server. And uh, I think that has no effect on security, except that the client would need to uh, maintain a snapshot of uh, its current operating state to know which documents to refetch in order to rewrite them. So um, I, I would hope that standard transactional database techniques and key value store techniques would enable you to avoid uh, the worst uh, aspects of that kind of crash. But clearly, uh, in practice, you need to clearly you need to carefully architect your system to deal with that kind of issue. Thanks for the question. Okay, last question. Uh, Alexandra Anzala Yamayako asks: Does your model provide insight as to how to deal with fancier query types, i.e., conjunctive, conjunctive or range, etc.? Not yet, uh, and, and so uh, I should uh, perhaps emphasize this, that the Swiss, as it's currently de designed, only caters for single keyword search queries, which of course is a very limited class of queries in practice. Um, and uh, again, it's a really interesting and maybe quite tough open question to extend these kinds of techniques to handle more complex query classes. That's certainly something we intend to do. Okay, thank you so much, Kenny, for the talk. And, thank you. Um, we're off to the next one. So um, up next is Sophie, Sophie Schmig, who's going to be speaking about in-band key negotiation, trusting the attack, um, which is uh, really exciting. Sophie, you're up. Okay. Um, Hello, uh, my, my name, name is Sophie Schmieck. I'm from Google's ISE crypto team, and I'm here today to talk about keys and specifically negotiating key parameters. Uh, what problems can arise there and how we solve these problems with Intink, uh, the open source crypto library that my team maintains for the use at Google and in the wider industry. Um, first off, I will talk a bit about JWT. Uh, JWT is somewhat famous for its difficulty to implement it, uh, with one of the common issues being uh, access tokens uh, that can be accepted without any form of authenticity, because you can change the algorithm as uh, to none, and this issue is so common that there is a website out there that counts the number of days since this has last impacted some real life systems. So this is, even so it sounds a bit uh, uh, obvious, it is something that actually affects uh, real world crypto a lot. Um, so how does this work? Normally with a JRT, uh, you prove that you're authorized to access some resource by having some sensible algorithm choice. And in case of a valid token, uh, you have an attached signature. However, the standard allows you to set this algorithm to none, uh, which then results in a token that is valid without any signature, and you circumvent uh, any controls that there may be. Um, but I want to make the point that none isn't the only uh, problem uh, uh, here. It's uh, the, the fact that there is an algorithm field at all uh, because, because you, you can, can also switch this algorithm field to um, uh, some symmetric scheme, at which point the implementation will just take the public key and interpret that as a secret key material in uh, a lot of cases, and that means that anyone can mint a valid token uh, without a problem. Uh, Sophie, uh, sorry to interrupt, but um, there is some feedback happening um, from your talk. It's very echoey. I'm not sure if it's coming from you or from someone else. Um, 
me check. Set up to use the right. Does this work? Is this better? There's still some echo. It's a different kind of echo. Okay. Can maybe everyone else mute? That often helps. There's a couple of people who have still got open mics. It's Okay. okay. Is, is, is this working, working now? now? No, it's still the same. I think, um, if not worse, we're we're seeing in the chat. Um, you may be playing back the Zoom audio uh, on your own speakers, so you may want to mute that because um, I think we're getting like a double. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm not, not using, using speakers. speakers. I'm, I'm going, going to uh, make, make it so that it makes, makes no sound. sound. I, I hope, hope that, that it works better now. Uh, unfortunately not. Um, if, if you have, uh, are you using the speaker um, or the uh, microphone connected to your headphones? So, so I, can't I can't hear anyone, anyone anymore, anymore, but um, oh. I hope that I fix, fix the, the problem. problem. Okay. Hang tight, everybody. Sorry. Uh, That's strange. I'm going, going to, to try, try and reload, reload uh, 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 Zoom. One more microphone to test. Is, is this, this, is this, this working? working? Nope. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm so, so sorry, sorry about this. this. Uh, uh, I have, I have no, no idea, idea how to, to fix, fix this, this in, in Zoom. Zoom. Well, um, we can understand you. It's just a little bit distorted. Okay. So I, I will just, just continue, continue and I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry. sorry. I have no, no idea, idea what's happening, happening here. Uh, I tried, tried it out before my computer, computer this morning and decided, decided to lock me out of everything. everything so, so maybe it's just, just cursed or something. Or something. Um, so, so uh, uh, the, the problem, problem uh, uh, is not, not only this algorithm field, field uh, but, but there are other header fields, fields that have similar styles, styles of problems. problems. Um, here. And now oh, it muted, muted me. Oh, my apologies, that's my fault. I'm so sorry. Okay. Okay, okay, so, so um, it's, it's uh, not, not only the algorithm field that has this style of problem, problem. other had fields, fields here, the key ID, ID uh, which is a freeform free field which hints which key to use, use can be similarly attacked. attacked. Um, if, if you have some key uh, in, in this style, style then you, the attacker, attacker can just, just switch out the real key with the key that, that they control. Um, this, this is arguably a somewhat artificial example because it uh, assumes that the unstructured PID field here is used in this specific way, uh, but there have been issues like this in the wild, so this is not completely out of the question. Um, this type of issue isn't uh, specifically constrained to JWT, but it's unfortunately quite a common uh, place issue. The basic weakness is attaching metadata information, information that you need to authenticate and decrypt to the ciphertext itself. Um, here's, here's an example of a vulnerability that I found last year in AWS's SV client-side encryption library, which since has been fixed. Um, as with uh, JWT, uh, we see an algorithm metadata field. In this case, the encryption algorithm for the DEC in a standard DEC encryption system with this, this metadata, metadata field not, not having, having its authenticity guaranteed by the CAC. Um, the, uh, 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 this, this can, can be exploited by switching out the listed AES-GCM of, of a given ciphertext text, uh, with AES-CBC, um, and, and then derive a spe specific test ciphertext 
that allows the attacker to use a padding oracle to confirm guesses of, of 16 bytes of plain text at a time. Um, so if the attacker can guess 16 bytes of plain text, they can decrypt the file. Um, I now want to uh, show how we try to avoid these issues within Ting, trying to reduce this kind of problem within Google products. Um, first, here's the abstraction of a Ting key, uh, which, as you can see, does not only contain the raw key material, which I uh, like showed with this uh, uh, last column uh, parameters here, but, but it, it also has, has the algorithm, algorithm choice uh, and the parameters for this algorithm here, ECDSA and the curve and, and hash stored within in the key. key. Um, by, by having, having those in the key, we avoid uh, having to use the ciphertext for this metadata, um, and uh, we don't get any kind of switching from the ciphertext. Uh, this, this is a nice solution for the algorithm, algorithm but it doesn't really allow for things like key rotation. So it doesn't, it doesn't uh, extend to the key ID uh, quite, quite as well. well. Um, for, for the key ID, ID we have uh, an arbitrary but meaningless, meaningless constant um, and uh, group, group together, together several, several keys into, into a single key set. set. And, and the, the idea, idea here is that all the keys in the key sets, sets are, equally are equally trusted and uh, there's, there's just one key that is marked as primary to do the encryption or signing, or signing operation, operation, but, but all, all keys can be used, used to verify or decrypt. Or decrypt. Um, these key IDs could, could be simply incrementing IDs, or in Tink's case, they are just random but unique integers. Um, so, so with, with all this information, how does a ciphertext or a signature, signature now look like? How does the, the format now look like? like? Um, uh, the ciphertext now has three parts. First, First, there is a format, format version. Um, adding a format, format version is just usually, usually a, good a good thing to do if you need to change something later because, because we discovered that it was actually not a good format. format. Uh, so, so far, we it didn't, didn't have to do that. that. Uh, and, and for our purposes, purposes we can always assume that that is just the byte OS one. And, and you can, in fact, recognize that some Google product was using Tink because, because it, it has, has a base 64 encoded block, block uh, that, that always starts, starts with, with, with capital, capital A. a. Um, this, this is followed by the key ID. ID. Uh, the key ID allows, allows us to jump directly to the key uh, that is used to, in this case, verify uh, the, the signature. And uh, it does so without giving any advantage to the attacker, because, because all that the attacker can do here by changing this ID is to jump to a different key in, in our, our key set, set and, and we assume that all keys are equally trusted, uh, so that, that uh, means that the attacker, attacker will not know this other key as well. well. Uh, uh, this, this means that if a key gets compromised, it has to be removed from the key set. And also, if you want to have a full key rotation, uh, it will only be completed once you actually remove the key from the key set. And the last part of the ciphertext is then just the rest, rest of, of the, uh, uh, just, just the output, output of whatever, whatever the algorithm uh, produces per its, its normal, normal standards. standards. Um, it's, it's important, important to uh, note that even this relatively bare bones ciphertext format changes, changes the property of the primitive in question. And uh, while we use this format for most primitives, uh, sometimes, sometimes we have to use a different solution just because, because of the guarantees that the primitive makes. You can, can for example, not use a PRF to, uh, with a static prefix because it wouldn't be random anymore. Um, on to the key takeaways. First off, uh, you should never trust the ciphertext, uh, at least not until, until you, know you know that it wasn't provided by the attacker. attacker. Um, that, that usually means uh, you have to verify a signature or a MEC, uh, and at that point you're pretty much uh, halfway done with your cryptographic operations, so uh, you should just not trust the ciphertext. But the harder uh, thing in practice is to remember what that means. That means that all metadata that you require to verify the authenticity of the ciphertext has to be seen as part of the key and not as part of the ciphertext. Um, technically, technically, you only, you only have, have to have this metadata uh, authenticated, authenticated 
it, it doesn't, doesn't have, have to be kept, kept secret, secret like the, the key has, has but uh, uh, authenticating something is uh, often quite hard, hard uh, so, so that, that you can, can just put it into, into the key, key itself and you know that uh, everything uh, uh, is authentic and uh, encrypted anyway. Um, as, As a last, last takeaway, uh, key IDs have, have to be used quite carefully. Uh, they cannot be authenticated because they have to be attached to the ciphertext to actually do anything. Uh, so you have to have some switch between keys that you equally trust. And you cannot assume that uh, uh, just by rotating to a different primary key, you're already uh, in the clear, you have to actually be at, be at the, the point, point where you remove the, uh, uh, remove the old keys in order to uh, have a full, uh, uh, fully restored trusted key set in case of compromise. Um, um, and with that, that, I would like to thank you for your time. time. I'm, I'm sorry for, for the technical, technical issues, issues um, and, and I hope that there are some good questions. questions. Okay, thanks, Sophie. Um, are there any questions on the Zulip? I'm still looking here. Um, in, in the meantime, uh, I have a question. Um, you've studied these sort of signed objects. Uh, how, how does this research apply to, say, interactive protocols uh, like transport protocols? Have you seen anything similar? Yeah, yeah so, so for, for transport, transport protocols, protocols, there is a similar, similar thing. Like, like in, in part, part of the problem, problem that happens here is that, that uh, uh, in, in an, an interactive, interactive protocol, protocol like TLS, like you, you will negotiate the parameters that are necessary for the encryption before you do any encryption or before you do any crypto. And uh, it's somewhat similar in this, uh, in this asynchronous protocol or in this asynchronous case uh, that you have to do the same thing of having the parameters decided before you do the actual cryptographic operation. It's less obvious that that is what is happening because of, uh, of that, but like, um, the, the protocols, protocols have similar issues when they negotiate parameters uh, within the actual cryptography uh, instead of doing that in a separate step beforehand. Okay, one uh, question from the chat. Um, to what degree could vulnerability discovery of these types of issues be automated? Any plans to do such automation at Google? Um, we, we have, have some, some plans, plans of that. that. It's, it's somewhat, somewhat hard to like uh, uh, discover like things outside of uh, your, your, your actual, actual cryptographic, cryptographic library. library. Like, like what, what usually happens is that the cryptographic, cryptographic library provides uh, uh, like you, you, give, you, you ask it for a certain algorithm, you ask it uh, to use this key, and, and then uh, the, uh, the, uh, the vulnerability, vulnerability comes, comes from, from the fact that. that the library, the library is perfectly, perfectly fine, fine, but the way it was used, uh, somehow the engineer had to store this information somewhere that then did that in a way that, that actually influenced the cryptographic properties of the larger scheme. And, and so uh, uh, if, if you, you want, want to automate, automate any of that, that uh, you, you have, have to be very, be very careful where you have to, uh, where, where you set, set the scope of things, because if, if uh, uh, you, you have too much, much of a, uh, if you have too much of a wide scope, scope the automation will not work. If you have too much of a small scope, scope you will miss exactly, exactly these issues. Okay, one um, last question here is, so how does Tink handle PRF outputs? Just raw bytes? Yes. yes. For, For PRF, PRF outputs, outputs it, it will uh, transform the key set into a set of PRFs and the caller has to select which of the PRFs of the key set it, uh, they, they want, want to, to use, use, and, and the, the output, output will just be the raw bytes of the, of the PRF. PRF. Okay, um, there's one more question that came in last second. Could you give an example of what you mean by key metadata in the expression key metadata is part of the key? Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean the, the algorithm, algorithm, the parameters of the algorithm, algorithm uh, things, things like, like key IDs, IDs uh, everything that you need, need to actually like, like the, uh, oftentimes, oftentimes when, when people talk about the keys, keys they, they, uh, about, about the key, key they, they talk about these, these like 32 uh, random, random bytes. bytes. And, and everything, everything that, that you need to actually transform these 32 random bytes, bytes into, into a usable thing that, that is key metadata. Data. Okay, thank you for the talk, Sophie. Um, that was great.
Uh, up next is Paul Grubbs, who's going to be talking about Pancake Frequency Smoothing for Encrypted Data Stores. Paul, take it away. Thanks. I'm going to try to share my screen. Um, I think this is going to work. Uh, can you can you see uh, a PowerPoint? Yes, you'll just need to put it into presentation mode, which is perfect. Okay, is that good? Yes. And you, you can't see the Zoom bar, can you? No, not at all. Okay, great. Okay, uh, well, thanks you, thank you, Nick, for that introduction. Um, so I'm going to be talking uh, today about a work that I presented along with all these fabulous co-authors at the uh, Usenix Security 2020. So the setting we're interested in this talk is cloud storage systems. Many, many applications are migrating their key value store backends to cloud managed key value storage. In this setup, a number of trusted clients all make key value queries to a not necessarily trusted cloud provider that hosts the actual key value pairs. Because we don't necessarily trust the cloud provider with the data itself, it's common practice to encrypt the key value pairs before they're uploaded by, for example, uh, applying a PRF to the key and an AAD encryption scheme to the value and to perform queries uh, directly on these encrypted pairs. Unfortunately, we know that simply encrypting the data can't guarantee its security because of access pattern attacks, where the cloud provider passively monitors the accesses made by clients and uses the information it gains in tandem with auxiliary knowledge of the distribution of accesses to break security. For example, imagine medical data is indexed by patient condition. The adversarial cloud provider can observe how frequently different keys are accessed and uh, may have some prior knowledge about the overall prevalence of different conditions in the population. So this cloud provider can use frequency analysis, uh, or in this case, simply mapping the most frequently accessed key to cancer, the second most frequently accessed key to epilepsy, et cetera, et cetera, uh, to basically invert the mapping of PRF values to plain text keys and learn, uh, for example, when the hospital is cancering, uh, sorry, querying for a cancer patient. Uh, in the last few years, many different access pattern attacks like this have been uh, demonstrated in a variety of settings. So the question is, can existing cryptographic tools pre prevent access pattern attacks on key value stores? So there are basically two classes of existing solutions. The first is based on theoretical tools like oblivious RAM or private information retrieval. And it prevents access pattern attacks like the one we just saw. In fact, it pre prevents much stronger attacks, which are mounted by a, an active adversary that makes its own accesses in addition to monitoring honest client accesses. So this kind of attack in practice would correspond to a cloud provider that actively attacks its own customers. So the strong security provided by these primitives uh, incurs, uh, incurs overheads. We know that in theory, there must be at least a logarithmic blow up in bandwidth uh, for using these primitives. And that in practice, uh, this, this theoretical inefficiency translates to overheads of as much as 1600 X uh, for real workloads. So another class of solution is searchable uh, symmetric encryption or SSC, which offers pretty good performance, but can really only prevent access pattern attacks against a very weak snapshot adversary that, that can't see any queries. Uh, so this attack would arise in practice only if the cloud provider ignored the query information it was receiving from the clients. So in, in, this, uh, in this work, we basically explore a new uh, a threat model and try to ask the question uh, of, can we purpose build a countermeasure for these persistent passive access pattern attacks, like the one I described in the previous slide, where the, where the adversary can see the accesses but doesn't necessarily inject its own. We think this persistent passive threat model meaningfully captures a lot of threats that are faced by real deployments of, of cloud, cloud storage systems. Uh, so, th so the question is, uh, can we achieve good security and low uh, uh, performance overhead uh, in this persistent passive adversary? So how can we build an approach that does that? So the, the way we're gonna take advantage of this threat model is by having all the clients uh, make their accesses through a trusted client side proxy. And by giving the, by the, giving the proxy the same access to the same distribution that, the, uh, that we assume the adversary has. This is quite a natural assumption actually, because in practice key value, store, uh, key value stores already implicitly uh, maintain a lot of information about the access distribution to do things like caching and load balancing. So this work uh, has three main contributions. We show that uh, it, with, with this information in this model, uh, we show a novel frequency smoothing algorithm uh, that, uh, that, the, that the proxy can use to smooth the, ac the accesses made by clients to the uh, outsourced key value store. So this, uh, this attack prevents, this, sorry, this algorithm prevents access pattern attacks by ensuring that all accesses made to the key value store are uniformly random but it also incurs only a constant server storage and constant bandwidth overhead. 
uh, our algorithm forms the core of a, of a built proxy system for doing frequency smoothing, which we call Pancake. Uh, we, we also provided a formal security analysis uh, where we formulated a, a novel security goal for the, for the security that we want to achieve in the setting and we proved that our, our frequency smoothing algorithm achieves it in this persistent passive threat model. And finally, we showed uh, an extensive evaluation of the Pancake system and, and demonstrated that Pancake, Pancake's throughput is more than two orders of magnitude higher than the state-of-the-art uh, patho RAM not two times, two orders of magnitude. So just to reiterate and establish a little bit of notation, our system model is one in which key value queries are all independent samples according to a distribution pi known both to the adversary and to our proxy. So the approach of frequency smoothing, our, our, our goal is to try to transform the distribution of plain text accesses made by clients into a smoother distribution over a potentially larger set of encrypted items stored at the server. So there's basically two tools we're gonna to use to do this. Uh, the first is replication, where uh, we make multiple copies of the popular items in this distribution pie. Uh, and when we wanna query one of them, we sample one of them uniformly at random and access that one. So we, this method of replication can smooth completely any distribution, but it may require a lot of server-side storage overhead. Uh, another idea that we're gonna use here is fake accesses, uh, where when a client wants to make a query, it sends its real query along with some number of other fake queries, which are sampled according to some uh, dif distribution, which is complementary in some sense to the to, to this distribution pi that makes the overall access probabilities to all the keys uniform. Again, here, the problem is that using this, these fake accesses in isolation may lead to a lot of bandwidth overheads because you need to lot, send a lot of fake queries to make the, the access probabilities uniform. So neither of these tools really give us what we want uh, by themselves. So in Pancake, what we do is use them in tandem as follows. Uh, first, we use replication to partially smooth out the distribution of replicas subject to a bounded overhead on the server-side storage. Um, and then we use fake accesses to smooth out the remaining non-uniformity. Basically, we define a fake access distribution pi sub f, uh, which we can, uh, over the, the set of replicated key value pairs, which we can sample to, to uh, smooth out the, the distribution uh, totally. So in a, with a bit of math, and I'm waving my hands a little bit here because I don't have time to explain the details, but what we can show is that uh, for a single access, in expectation, we only need one fake access per real access. Uh, but we're, we're not actually done uh, because if we sample in our, in our fake access protocol, if we sample a fake access instead of a real one, we won't actually be able to service the client's query. So we need some more logic around this basic frequency smoothing protocol to ensure client queries are actually answered. Uh, the core difficulty in doing this is ensuring that the adversary can't distinguish real and fake accesses. Uh, our first couple of attempts in building this logic actually didn't ensure this and were insecure. So what we eventually came up with is uh, a, a, an approach that uses fixed size batches of accesses in response to each client generated access. So what we do basically is when a client query comes in, we put it in some kind of pending query queue, and then we flip uh, B fair coins. So we use B equals three in Pancake. And if one of those coins comes up heads, we dequeue a, a real query from the pending query queue, or we sample from the true query distribution pi. Uh, otherwise, if it comes up tails, we sample from our fake query distribution pi sub f uh, and send, uh, send uh, this, this whole batch of accesses to the server. So it's not too hard to see that uh, this method, this fixed size batching method results in at most 3x bandwidth overhead and at most 2x storage overhead over the kind of insecure baseline key value store. So uh, we analyzed the security of this uh, frequency smoothing approach um, under a couple of assumptions. The first is our persistent passive adversary that we talked about before. Uh, the second is that the pancake proxy has a reasonable estimate of the true query distribution pi. And the third is that the server can't distinguish between real and fake accesses by, for example, using some kind of timing analysis. So what we, what we prove, it, we formulate a security goal uh, called real or random indistinguishability under chosen distribution attack or ROR CDA. And what this says is that uh, Pancake guarantees that two different worlds are indistinguishable. The first is the real world where the adversary receives the set of replicated encrypted key value pairs and a transcript of T uh, encrypted uh, accesses uh, to these key value pairs that were generated by the real Pancake proxy. And it, in the, the other world is the ideal world in which the adversary receives random bit strings and basically a set of T uniformly random accesses to these random bit strings. And so what we prove is that Pancake uh, ensures that for any distribution, these two worlds are, are indistinguishable. So there were several additional challenges, which I don't have very much time to talk about, but I'll touch on very briefly here. Um, 
The, the first is to how do we update key value pairs that have multiple replicas? Uh, well, what we do is to take a kind of similar stashing approach that uh, Kenny described in his, presen his, his presentation, where we kind of buffer those updates at the proxy until we make an access to the correct, um, to the correct replica. Uh, to handle uh, changing access patterns, uh, we can assign, uh, we can adjust our fake distribution to, uh, to compensate for the kind of difference between the old and the new distribution, and then reassign replicas if necessary using a replica swapping protocol. And finally, to estimate the access distribution itself and to detect changes in the access distribution, uh, we use basically off-the-shelf tools, more or less from statistics, so like, uh, like histograms and like a two-sample KS test to detect changes in distribution. And there, there are a lot more details in the paper, and I encourage you to, to read the paper if you are, are interested. Uh, so finally, I'll, I'll describe uh, our, our evaluation. Uh, so this, in this experiment I'll describe, we use YCSB workload A, which is a very standard benchmark workload for key value store performance. And we used a data, a data set of a million one kilobyte key value pairs. So the takeaway from these numbers is that the server storage for Pancake is four times lower than Path ORAM, and the proxy storage is still quite low. It's only about 1% of server storage. Uh, but the throughput is 220 times higher than Path ORAM for, for Pancake, and the latency is 12 times lower than Path ORAM. So this isn't the only experiment we did. There's a very, very extensive evaluation uh, in the paper. So just to uh, wrap up and give you a summary. So Pancake uh, is the first system that protects data stores against access pattern attacks uh, with only a constant factor server storage and constant bandwidth overhead. Uh, we perform a formal security analysis establishing the persistent passive security of, of the Pancake protocol, establishing that it resists these access pattern attacks. And finally, we perform an extensive evaluation that demonstrates that Pancake's throughput is more than two orders of magnitude higher than the state-of-the-art path program. Thank you very much, and I'll take any questions. Thanks, Paul. Um, seeing how we're a little bit over, um, let's take the questions in the chat room and give folks a break. And so we'll see everyone back here in 20 minutes for the next invited talk. Thanks, everyone.